Hi, everybody, and welcome to Gem Friends. I'm your host, Sherry Hudson Passy from Carolina Girl Genealogy. And tonight, I am happy to have Melissa Barker, the archive lady, joining me. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Sherry. How are you tonight? I am really good. And I'm really glad that you were able to come and talk <laughs> to me tonight um, about the second episode of Finding Your Roots for this season. They talked uh, to Michael K. Williams, an actor, and they also talked to another actor, Felicity Huffman, both of them wanting to know more about their biological fathers. And both of these cases were extremely interesting, I thought. I'm yeah, go ahead if you want. I was gonna say that yes, they were very interesting. Um, I kind of I like how Finding Your Roots pairs up their uh, famous people, and you know, and in this episode was both of them wanted to know about their biological fathers who were sort of a mystery to them, yeah, and right. so you know, I know that there are a lot of people out there that are doing their DNA tests now, and they're finding out that they have fathers and they have biological fathers yes. or mothers and so you know i think this is a great episode for people like that i agree i agree um let's start first with michael k williams he was talking about um his father and how his father and mother met and had him but fortunately his father was already married and had another family <laughs> so that was something that was kind of, it was embarrassing for him to tell. He said it was hard for him to tell. But he did say that he knew his other, um, uh, his half siblings and that he was connected with them. And that's the side of the family that he wanted to, to trace. He wanted to know more about his father. Um, what got me, why I was so excited about this case, is they said that his father grew up in Greeleyville, South Carolina, which is in Williamsburg County. And I have ancestors in Williamsburg County. And so I got really, really excited that they were going to Greeleyville in Williamsburg County. They um, looked at a 1930 census for when his dad was eight and found him there. And then they kind of jumped. They kind of jumped back to the 1870 census and they were able to find his grandparents and they were Morrells. They were Elizabeth and Billy Morrell. I think that's how, you, how they pronounced it. And they lived in Greeleyville. And so the family had lived in Greeleyville for a long, long time. And uh, he said that he was sent there for the summers to, to hang out. I think he had a real connection there because, mm -hmm. you know, when it, when the program was all said and done and they revealed everything that they revealed, um, I found this episode to be a particularly good one for anyone who's doing African-American research mm -hmm. because I think sometimes they feel a little bit intimidated by the fact that, um, you know, the slaves came over on ships, they were dispersed, and it's difficult to find. And in his case they lived all of their lives once they stepped foot in the United States, very close to where they probably got off mm -hmm. of the boat. And so that is something that is very interesting to me. And I thought, and then to find out that he, where he was going in the summer times, the land is the same land that his slave ancestors worked exactly. and were living on. And, you know, what a connection. I know that I live on property that is uh, the fifth generation being in my husband's family. And so, you know, I all the time think about his family living on this property and that we get, we are fortunate to live here. And so it means something to us. So I can only imagine what it meant to him. Exactly. Finding out the story. I thought it was interesting. You know, they said that, you know, so many of the, the enslaved came through Charleston and then they were surprised that they didn't go far. Well, a lot of them didn't and were bought by, you know, mm -hmm. slave owners and, and they stayed in the Charleston area or were dispersed throughout South Carolina. So it wasn't a big surprise to me that they, you know, they went up to Greeleyville. Um, so they found him in the um, 1870 census and their ages indicated that they would have been enslaved. Um, I want to just talk just for a, just for a moment about a kind of a, a statement or, or a, a misunderstanding that it's hard to find slave names previous to 1870 before um, they were named in those census. There are loads of documents that contain the names of the enslaved. And I thought it was interesting because genealogist uh, Nika Smith, after this episode came out, put this uh, 
statement on Facebook and I wanted to share it. She said, formerly enslaved people were documented with legal names before the 1870 census. There are millions of documents naming them before 1865 that still exist and can be found. They are in county parish courthouses, archives, libraries. So many of them are available, she says, for free online. So, you know, she says it's not rare. She has documented many. I, yeah. I would agree with her. I would agree with Nika's statement, and, and mm -hmm. Nika is a foremost authority on African American research. Exactly. And um, in fact, she was on. Was she not on the first the episode? First episode. She right? was. She was. Um, and so, or maybe that was. Who do you think you are? Was it? Who do you think you are? Finding your roots. I think it was finding your roots. I know she just recently was on something. <laughs> so yeah, I think we it, talked about I it. Think, I think her and her sitting there. I think it was. Who do you think you maybe are? Maybe it was. She maybe was it on was. One of those episodes. Mm -hmm. But, but the thing that, to keep in mind, and I think you know as well as I do, being a Southern researcher, you know, I do professional genealogy in Tennessee and you are there in South mm -hmm. Carolina. And I've seen records for African-Americans uh, before the 1870 census that have full names exactly. and they were in the enslaved. Exactly. And so while it's not every document we have that luxury, there are, she was right, there's a, a mm -hmm. tremendous amount of documents that are that way. There are. There are. Well, what was also interesting for me is they were able to connect his family back to the slave owner. Now, mm -hmm. I, I hope they had a little bit more documentation that they actually showed on the show because they said, look, do you recognize some of these names? I only recognized Elizabeth. <laughs> and so I was hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping that they had a few more to connect. But what threw me is that William Canty, who was one of the slave owners that they talked about from Williamsburg County, is actually a very distant cousin to me. Oh, that was <laughs> well, you know, what? We, we it's a small world. I say all the time when I find new information or I talk to a genealogist that connects and it's a small, small world. And it gets smaller it really every time you do research. But it you really know, is. It's, it's, it's that's amazing. And I can imagine how you felt when you heard that name. I, I did. I did. I, I quickly, as soon as it was, it was over, you know, I heard the name William Canty and I went, wait a second, I've got Canty's. Ah, so I went, of course, and was looking at my tree and found out it was like fifth cousin, six times removed or something like that. But still, that's, that's, that's too close for comfort. But as you said, when you are doing Southern research, you are going to find slave owners in your family tree. You are just going to to find them. And so I think it's important that as we find these records, that we get the names out, that we extract them from the documents, put them online and in other places where their descendants can find them. And if we can help connect down from our ancestors down to them. So it, it, it can be a little um, sobering when you, when you find that. I know my grandmother used to say, oh, my, my people were too poor to own slaves. That is not the case. You know, it's just not, it's just not the case. Your, your ancestors um, from the South and, and even from the North, from the West, it doesn't really matter at that time period. Um, they either owned slaves or they supported the industry in one way or the other in many parts of, of our country. So we need to be uh, looking for those documents and, and helping get those, those names out there so that their descendants can find them. So anyway, that was that was a little that was a little tricky for me. And then his daughter Mary married um, what was his name? It was Robert Keels, and they had a whole list yes. of of the slaves. And they said that there was like three generations of his family that that they had owned. I don't know if maybe. I mean, it's there's nothing good about slavery, but maybe that meant at least the family got to stay together. You know, if there was three generations perhaps. And there was 15, 15 members of the family they counted that he had owned. Um, they eventually were able to, after, um, after emancipation, um, Billy Morell was able to register to vote, which is a, is a wonderful thing. I mean, that, that didn't really last long in the South. It just, you know, but he, um, 
you know, the Jim Crow laws came in and uh, people were persecuted and, and they may have registered to vote, but new laws made it such that they really, really couldn't. Um, but he was able to buy some of that land, as you talked about mm -hmm. at the beginning. How wonderful that some of the land that they, they had worked on and slaved on, you know, where they were enslaved, they were able to buy and it was theirs right there on the census record, it said they were owners of a hundred acres of land. That's amazing. That's absolutely that's, amazing. That's really amazing. And and I think that you could see in, um, was it Michael? Is that mm -hmm. his name? Mm -hmm. You could see in his face because, you know, the whole time they were doing his story, I could see the apprehension. Yes. And I think he even mentioned that he was worried about what he might find coming there. Mm -hmm. And I think in the past, we've talked about whether or not these celebrities are told beforehand. Right. You know, we talked about that. And it, it was obvious with him that they did not tell him anything. Because as his story unfolded, you could see that him getting just a little bit more relaxed yes. um, and a little yes. more proud of his family. Yes. And then when they showed the map where that piece of property still is today and exactly. is part of it, family's property yes. you know you could just see him straighten up just a little just, bit more yes. and, you know. <laughs> and was, so, was so proud of that and i loved how they showed him that map that they were able to show him exactly where mm -hmm. that was and so i'm hoping that it didn't take him too long to get back there and walk that well, land I thought, about that. I thought i wonder if how much yes get there just to see that land and to think about what right. you know he learned about his family and um but that was just a fabulous story i could it's tell us too you know, his emotions were really on his sleeve and but i think the information he got is going to really stick with him and um it helps him you know it helps us sometimes to know our family story for whatever yes. reason for each individual person and i think good, I or, bad. Mm -hmm. good or bad good or bad and i think with him it really has meant something I think so too. I liked how he was talking about his aunt boots yes. <laughs> and that she always wore boots and was out in the field. And he says, now I understand. I understand why they were farmers, why they lived the lifestyle they lived because they've been here for so long, for so many generations. So it just kind of came full circle for him. And I just thought that was, it was just wonderful. I really enjoyed that. Even, even with the <gasps> moment that I had, <laughs> it's still, I, I, I enjoyed that story. And, and I did, I looked up some of those records and I want to see if I can pull some of that out maybe too, and, and get some of those records out. So we need to move on now oh, and yeah. talk about Felicity Huffman. What a story oh. she had finding out at 14 that the man that she always thought was her father was not her father and that it was a family friend. Ah, and what a way her mom told her. She oh, said, I know. Smoking, she was... <laughs> smoking a cigarette in the bathtub and just yep. told her. Just, I mean, just out of the blue told her, how do you process something like that? Yeah. And, and she said, where do I put this? Mm -hmm. I don't even know where to put this. Which So I thought it was really interesting that she decided for the show that she wanted to know more about her biological father. I thought that was really brave of her and very, very interesting that that's the line she chose to to look at. It, it is. And, you know, at the end, not, not to be a spoil, but mm -hmm. at the end of her story, after she was shown everything and such an interesting story and interesting family, uh, you know, Mr. Gates asked her, you know, now how do you feel about your biology? And she felt exactly the same. Yeah. She, didn't she said he will <laughs> never be my right. father. Yeah. I was I, hoping that she had warmed to the family in some way. But I think she warmed to the family, but not to him. Not to all. him. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's not that she never confronted him. She had confronted him. They had talked several times. They kind of had a semi quasi she said weird awkward relationship yeah but the man that raised her she said was my dad i was very close to him so you know i, I thought that was very just very interesting that she chose and what she found out they started with looking at her biological dad's um her his actual uh, birth certificate which led back to his parents so they were able to get their names and they were frank and grace um Brown Muir, Muir, I think was the way you pronounce that last name. Uh, 
and then they found out that Frank actually died when her father, biological father, Roger, was just a toddler. They'd only been married four years mm -hmm. when he died. So then she went back to live with her parents, with, with Roger, took him, and they were able to find them in the census. And that's how they knew, you know, where she'd gone. They found her in the census living with her, her father and his wife. And I thought this was a really good lesson to learn for people with census records, because on a census record, it doesn't say that this wife necessarily is the mother of the children. The right. only way you're going to get that connection would be if the mother's the head of household. Mm -hmm. The connections on a census record are based on whoever the head of household is. So you're going to have the dad, then you're going to have the wife, and then you're going to have the children. There's no guarantee that that woman listed as wife is the mother of all those children. Yes, I have several of those in, mm -hmm. in my ancestry and my husband's ancestry. And, you know, I, I'm always, I always love it when they're using census records. I think that for some reason nowadays, census records is kind of, I don't know, it, it looks, it's looked at as one of those first stepping stones for beginning genealogists. Mm -hmm. And, and then we kind of look at them and put the, push those aside so quickly to get to other records. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we spend enough time with census records. I agree. As genealogists, um, there agree. is just so much mm -hmm. to glean from them. And so I, I, I'm always great. I always love it when I see census records being shown and used for research. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and used in a way to explain an aha moment maybe to somebody who's never noticed mm -hmm. that before. And so that was the case, was this woman on the census record was not her mother. And it turned out that Grace's mother had died when she was eight years old from tuberculosis. Yeah. And so Grace lost her mother, then her husband, you know, and, and Roger, you know, grew up without his father. And so they were kind of talking about maybe that affected some of his choices in his life. But, you know, we, we never know. You never know about, about things like that. But, you know, maybe perhaps it did. Maybe perhaps it did. Well, you can't help yeah. but think that it yeah. affected him in exactly. what ways we don't know. Sure. But, um, you know, I just, I just knew I was, you know, I was watching this and I just knew that she was going to find a soft spot in her heart for Roger. And it just didn't happen. It, it, and, it, you know, but we don't know what happened after the show. No, maybe. we don't. We don't know what happened yeah. after the show. She did say that finding out this, um, information though did she said it was very emotional and she said she just didn't know where to put it. She was just having a hard time. And you could tell through the whole thing, she just was having a hard time processing and, what does this mean for me? You know, these are, I came through these people. Are they my family? I'm not sure is, um, is yeah. basically what, what she kept saying. Then they got back to her fourth great grandfather. I liked his name, Walter Wooster. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a cool name. And he was born in 1745 mm -hmm. and they were able to find him on muster rolls for the revolutionary war. Yes. And then what I thought was really cool about that is one of the, I guess, a, a general for one of the um, campaigns that he fought in wrote to Washington about the men who fought in his unit. And he said that there were men worthy to be free mm -hmm. <laughs> was on this document. And she loved that document. She wanted to frame it because, they, you know, they had the copy of it in the big book that he, you know, puts things yeah. together for. So men worthy to be free. I loved that. I thought that was so wonderful. And, and uh, again, as you, you probably, it, it just shows that point again that even if our ancestors are not mentioned in a document, we still need to read about the history of the mm -hmm. things that they went through, the events they went through, so we can get a little bit of better understanding. So she now knows that her ancestor was among those men who fought with so much courage that they were men worthy to be free. How wonderful is that? It's, it's awesome. And, you know, I always encourage genealogists whenever possible mm -hmm. to look at the original records, you know, even if they're on microfilm or, you know, digitized, or if you go to the archive, you can actually look at the actual record. Because if you look at these people on finding your roots, who do you think you are? When they see these records, mm -hmm. 
you can see them react, oh, yeah. you know, and these two yeah, were yeah. just the same, especially her when she saw that one, yeah. you know, and, and the thing about us, when we get a document that is got our, you know, our ancestor signature on it or mentions, you know, our ancestor or just mentions them as part of a group and what they did for our country, yes. you know, it really, or finding a piece of property that your ancestors have had for so long it truly really brings it home and for me it gets me more excited and makes me want to do more research exactly and find yep. more information and keep going and keep going yes. and so you know to, it's that's why i encourage genealogists you know seeing an index online is great transcription's mm -hmm. fine yep. oh but go get those musty smelly old books out oh. of the archives <laughs> Even even if that copy, you know, even th there's the the copy, the scanned copy mm -hmm. of the original, you know now that that original is there. Yes. So get everything you can online, then make a list of all those things mm -hmm. that you want to go and feel and touch and hold and smell <laughs> and look at for yourself, and and to go. It just to makes it real. Oh, it, it does. makes it real. It, and it, that's what I like about these television shows. I mean, I, I, I'm like a lot of everybody, all of the other genealogists, I wish they would tell us how many hours it took and some of the stuff that they may not say that, you know, is on the cutting room floor or something. But you know what? It is fantastic television to show not only those of us that have been doing this for a long time, but those that are just getting started. You know, I'm hoping that it really lights a fire in them to oh, keep going. Oh, yeah. Because I'm excited. how many times have we been disappointed on our journey and wanting to give up? You know, just don't give up. Just yeah. keep going. Absolutely. Absolutely. They also went back even further. <laughs> they went, <laughs> they, and they ended up going back to a ninth great grandparent for her. Mm -hmm. They found the Hickox. And I was kind of wondering if it was going to go down to Wild Bill Hickok. I wonder oh, if, that's okay. Is that what she thought? Yeah. Well, and they explained to her, this ancestor of yours was alive in the time of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. I mean, that really puts it into perspective, it doesn't does. it? It does. Because yeah. you, you think of, yes, the 1600s, but to say, you know, he was alive during the time of Shakespeare mm -hmm. is, is quite a statement and, and really helps you think about what was going on during that time period. I want to say I found it interesting that as they introduced her to this ninth great grandfather, they said, it's rare to find a ninth great grandfather. And meanwhile, I was thinking, well, it might not be so rare. I've got a few. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> this canty line from the other story, uh -huh. The immigrant ancestor of that candy line, candy line is actually my ninth great grandfather from Ireland. So I thought it was a little kind of, mm -hmm. kind of weird, you know, that, yeah. So, uh, yeah, many of us do. And you can get back to your ninth great grandfather. I don't believe that it's rare. Um, it takes some work and you have to be lucky enough that, you know, there were enough documents and, and they don't even have to be rich people I have found. They just kind of had to be there in the right place at the right time for documents to have been, you know, mm -hmm. that you can find that, that are still, you know, extant, that are still available. But I'm sure you probably have some ninth grade grandparents on you your know, tree. I, we were talking before and um, just this past year, uh, some records came on Ancestry.com because I cannot get to France. <laughs> and my maiden name is Lee Master, and it is French. And um, Abraham, and it was spelled differently back then, Lee Master. Sure. Um, I actually was able to find his christening or his baptismal record. That's what it was, a baptismal record, dated 1635 in wow. the Jersey Isles, which are just off the coast of France. Sure. Um, and so I think he is about my ninth yeah. great grandfather. And yeah. so finding those, and he was my. The one that jumped the pond. He's the he, he, first. This was mm -hmm. the, actually been the first time I've been able to jump the pond, as you say. Um, and so it was a great find this yeah. past year for me to find that. That's wonderful. So, so you know, we're we're here to say, keep going. You can do it. You can find those ninth great grandparents. It might take for some. It, it could be that you know somebody's already done it, and all you've got to do is connect your person to to them. Or it could be just a matter of you looking just a little bit harder, you know, learning or, about. Like me waiting or trying for 29 years and finally finding it. But guess what? Yeah, exactly. I finally found it. I did, if I had given up, I and never would have found it. And, you know, so new record collections become available all yes. the time. 
you know, to help you do this research. So, you know, cousin connections may, you know, come to you that can help you. So don't, don't give up. Don't let some of these statements of rare, hardly ever, you know, don't let that discourage you. Keep looking, keep seeing, learn about the new, uh, new record types to you, you know, what, learn about how to search in archives if you don't know. Learn about newspaper research if you've not done it before. W learn how to research in different record groups instead of saying, oh, I've looked in census, I've looked in the vital records, you know, those basic ones we've talked about that a lot of beginners use and we still use. It's not like, you know, we don't use those records, but sometimes you get kind of caught up in these are the records I know how to research in. So if it's not in these records I know how to research in, I'm done. I can't mm -hmm. find them. It's not available. There are so many different record types that you can learn about. I, you know, as an archivist, you know, um, I am processing records every day. Huh? These are not, you know, records that have been discovered or th they have just been a little bit languishing on the shelves. And so they get finally get processed. Mm -hmm. I encourage genealogists, you know, even if you don't live near the places where your ancestors live and those where the archives are, call them, email them, check their websites mm -hmm. and ask this question. Ask, what have you got new? Now, it's not new as in the record was made yesterday, but right. maybe it's new and then it was just walked brought into the door donated yesterday or maybe it's been sitting on the shelf and they've just been able to process it in the last sure. week sure. and so yeah. you know you think well i've already checked at that archives i already checked everything they have they may have new stuff just waiting for you to find it exactly and and with the the your online record databases too yes they're constantly adding more mm -hmm. records and you can actually go to them and sign up for their newsletters and get an email and they'll tell you this is what we put on this week or this month these are the new records that we have these ones have been indexed more completely so don't don't give up you can, you no. can get back there and further it just takes some determination and you know, just working at it <laughs> and, and maybe put it aside for a little while and go work on another line and then go back and see what's new and, and what you might be able to find. So look for those yeah. records. Um, is there anything about anything else about these two stories that, that we haven't talked about that you would like to, to bring up before we end? I, I just like to say that, you know, these two are a perfect example of, um, Families are not perfect. Mm. And all of us have skeletons in our closets. We have gone going to be, we're probably going to do DNA tests. They're not going to come back quite what we think that they should be. <laughs> uh, don't let that scare you. You know, you're, you came from a tremendously long line of people. Those people are not perfect. Those people um, live their lives the best that they could. Um, you don't have to accept them. But research them anyway. Don't be afraid of what you might find. Uh, document it, you know, research it and and just let it enrich you. Let it let it, you know, uh, help to tell your entire story, because I just think it's, it's all rich. It's all um, something that um, we should, you know, be seeking out. I, I agree with you. And I've noticed a few times with some of these shows that people have said, you know, my ancestor may not have been on what I consider the right side of history, but I've learned more about history and understand a little bit more about perhaps why people chose to do what they did. And sometimes even if we don't understand, it does give us a perspective that maybe we hadn't thought of before. So like you said, we do find people that are not perfect. Mm -hmm. We ourselves aren't perfect, but you know, right. they're, they're part of our family. They're part of our story. They're part of our history. And we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. So we don't Absolutely. have to accept actions. We don't have to condone actions, but there are things that we can do. Like we mentioned before with the records of the enslaved, there are things that we can do with those records to help others in most cases, you know? Mm -hmm. So take those records and see what positive that you can you can do with them that's absolutely true 
Yeah. Well, thank you, Melissa. Thank you so much for, for coming on because nobody wants to hear Jen friends with just me. <laughs> so You don't want me to just talk about everything. Although, you know what? I probably could sit here and just talk for half an hour <laughs> and everybody would click it off because they'd be tired of hearing from me. Anyway, so I always appreciate you being here. I love talking with you and getting your insight on these shows. Thank you so much. Always great to be here with you, Sherry. Thank you. And with that, we will see you next time on Gen Friends. Bye, everybody. <laughs>